Many people live by the self-preferencing maxim that independence is the end goal or end all be all to life. I mean, look around. There's young men and women as young as 14 years old working jobs for the goal to eventually move out on their own so they can possess the power to act, speak, and think as they want without hindrance or restraint. Moreover, there are laws that protect this very freedom and concomitantly my ability to verbalize my thoughts that you're witnessing as we speak. So I'm not mentioning independence with the negative connotation because if anything, independence is encouraged, if not praised in America's individualistic society, right? But answer me this, considering extremes, what would life be without a witness? This question may sound familiar because it's kind of similar to philosopher George Berkeley's theoretical inquiry concerning subjective idealism that asks, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? I asked this question because I wanted to briefly discuss the correlation of culture, self, and identity by challenging the notion of ideal control and vulnerability and the widely known quote spoken by James Anthony Froude that you probably may have heard at least once in your lifetime that states, we enter in this world alone, we leave in this world alone. But considering the mascot of quantum superposition, Schrodinger's cat epitomizes the necessity for existential beings to have a witness to define their existence. Therefore, none of us live alone, nor do we die alone. To further explain, Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment devised by Nobel Prize winning physicist Erwin Schrodinger in 1935. He demonstrates a paradox concerning the thought of a cat inside of a poisonous box being both dead and alive until an outsider can perceive and determine its existential condition. Now considering, if individuals kept their identity in a box, who would they be if no one looked inside? Cross-cultural researchers Matsumoto and Zhuang elucidate in their well-researched 2016 book, Culture and Psychology, that although individuals can cognitively form ideological constructs about themselves, a self-concept is the cognitive representations of who one is, that is, ideas or images that one has about oneself in relation to others and how and why one behaves. Therefore, a human cannot define themselves without relational aspects. In other words, without social interactions, interconnection and interpersonal relationships, or more specifically, without you to witness my recollection of research verbatim and without a way for me to be able to receive your response, my words are presumed to have the significance of both something and nothing simultaneously as Extrinsic perception signifies our existential identity and intrinsically ties our fate to our social face. For instance, concerning the aforementioned verbatim, there is no way to say that those sources I used were scholarly without the reliability of peer review. Additionally, there would have been no way for humanity to identify me as black without the perceivable contrast with people who are white. On this account, exemplified by racism and prejudice, identity is a struggle that inexorably faces a fate of either acceptance or rejection by society, a reflexive concept of institutions. So regardless of the culture specific style, whether it concerns a predominantly individualistic or collectivistic society, humans grant identity to others and compare it to a cultural precedent. Concomitantly, cultural group members may label an individual as either an insider or an outsider of group membership by juxtapositions of cultural worldviews and subjective identifications whether the generalized reputation is true or not. So similar to the duality of self-concepts, humans cannot define a rejection line without the subconscious or conscious criterion of acceptance. And independence cannot exist without its counterpart, interdependence. So comprehensively, identity personifies dualism 
a system that integrates an individual's inner multifaceted, contextualized, dynamic view of psychological continuity and the outer social world into a whole. So therefore, I, I admit, I am not wholly independent. In fact, I am quite vulnerable, as I do not single-handedly own the words that I am speaking, nor my actions that you are perceiving. Because once you bear witness to my next word and the next or the next, I have no control over how you take that experience, interpret it, and define me. But I am willing to take that risk. So in, uh, and so in the words of Denzel Washington, I see you too. And I'm encouraged by what I see and strengthened by what I, what I see because Taking risk is not just about going for a job. It's also about knowing what you know and what you don't know. It's about being open to people and to ideas, the chances you take, the people you meet, the people you love, and the faith that you have. That's what's going to define you. So to reiterate, I disagree with fruit because whether we like it or not, our lives are in each other's hands. And until we grasp this concept, I believe that we will continue to struggle as a society, continue to clash and kill each other over this unattainable belief that we can acquire this utmost control, power, and the freedom to do and say whatever we want without consequences. So we need a change. We need to start acting like we came into this world together and are going to leave it together.